Good evening. How are you guys doing? I hope you guys have had an amazing Wednesday. I'm excited about talking to you guys on tonight. I look forward to speaking with you and giving you what the Lord has laid on my heart. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Do me a favor as you begin to come in, be sure to like and share. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here tonight. As a matter of fact, I didn't even write out any notes um, because I just wanted to give you what the Lord laid upon my heart. You know, um, anytime, well, every, of course, you know, I come out every Wednesday night and I teach and I always pray and ask the Lord what he wants me to teach about. I, I, I ask him early in the day. So typically a lot of times early in the day, I have an idea. Um, and then there are times where I have to kind of just wait it out and like, he'll give it to me at the last minute. And today was one of those days. So initially I was going to initially, and don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. Initially I was going to come out and I was going to talk about type A females. And the reason I said, don't get mad at me, because that may be something that triggers you. So if you want me to talk about that, let me know. I wanted to come out and deal with personality types. Um, because I've had some really interesting conversations in the last few days about type A's. And I talked to a sister in Christ of mine and we were both on the phone. I mean, I know I was crying laughing and we were just screaming, laughing on the phone about, you know, personality types or what have you. So that's what I was going to come out and talk to you guys about. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the Lord wrecked my plans and the Lord wanted me to come out and talk to you about this season that many of you are entering. Um, but before I start teaching on that, I want to make sure that we have at least 100 people here on YouTube. So do your due diligence for me. Be sure to like and share. Um, for those of you who are on Facebook, don't forget to engage a lot of times on Facebook. Um, I'm always fussing at Facebook because a lot of times you guys forget to engage. So be sure to engage so I can see I am in StreamYard. So I can't see much of anything um, through StreamYard. I'm, a I'm able to see the chat from Facebook and Instagram. And I can see the likes and stuff like that or what have you. And there's always a high engagement on YouTube and a low engagement on, on Facebook. So that's the reason why you will find me all too often fussing um, at my Facebook family. Because I, I know a lot of times you can kind of forget because you're not necessarily looking at the chat. Nevertheless, let's get into the message. We need 16 more people in here and then we're going to jump right in. Um, but again, this is something that the Lord laid upon my heart. And I wanted to come and convey this to you. And I think that this is going to help to prepare so many of you for the season that you're about to enter. Um, it's going to prepare so many of you for the season that you're about to enter. God gave me revelation when I wrote the book of boundaries about the word season. He gave me revelation on the word season. And the revelation that he gave me was that season, a season wasn't what most of us have come to know, know it to be. The revelation that he gave me about season helped me to understand the necessity of works. You know, faith without works is dead. It helped me to understand the necessity or the need for works, the need basically to not be passive, not just in your deliverance, but in your promotion. Whatever it is that the Lord is wanting to do for you, you can't be passive. And for a long time, we as a church, we've kind of been really passive about the miracles, the favor, the blessings of God. So what we do is we sing, we dance, we shout, but then we go home and we don't apply what we learn. A lot of people in the church, a lot of Christians are not even consistent with reading their Bibles, not even consistent with praying, not consistent with doing their due diligence. But yet and still, a lot of Christians live in expectation. They live in the realm of hope and hope deferred makes the heart sick. And consequently, we end up giving the church a bad name because, you know, we're people come to know us by, you know, seeing us doing all of that stuff, but then going home and being broke and sick or what have you. And, and that's not the desire. That's not the heart of God for us is that we come out and we put on our brightest color suit and then we come up to church and then we, we dance, we shout and we cry. And then we go back home to the same old dysfunctional mindset and the same old dysfunctional lifestyle that we've been living in. It is the will of God that we embrace change. It is the will of God. So this is the revelation that he gave me about the word season. What he told me about the word season is this. He said, a season is not a space of time that you enter, even though there is a time element to the word season, but the word season, it really deals with a mindset. It deals with a mindset. So it's very similar to children. You know, 
with every age, there is a stage. With every age, there is revelation. So, for example, at the age of one year, at the age of one, a child is expected to start walking if the child isn't already walking. Between nine months and a year old, children are expected to walk. And within that space of time, you expect the child to say a few words to kind of start to adapt to, you know, the language that you speak. So the child may say, mama, dad, dad, you know, water, you know, they'll start speaking a little bit. Some children, I won't even say are more advanced than others. I don't necessarily know if people, I, I can't say whether or not people are more advanced. I think that it, 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 go, it all goes with the parent, you know, because if a parent is consistently speaking with their child, if you, then you consistently pick something up and you say phone, 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 eventually the child will understand that this is a phone. But when it comes to the word season, uh, or let's go back to this, at the age of two, you expect a child to speak full sentences, right? Even though they can't articulate, you know, some words well, even though their, their vocabulary is extremely limited, nevertheless, at the age of two, you expect a child to be able to communicate the basics, you know, um, and for the most part, they have a very expansive language. Most children have a very expansive language um, at the age of two. By the time the child is three, you expect that child to have, you know, a full vocabulary. And that's the same thing with us. We are, whenever we come into the kingdom, we are babes in Christ. And I want you to understand that with every stage, God has an expectation that's attached to you. And I want you to go back to the natural child. If a child is two years old and a child can't speak, then typically they're going to take the child to the test to make sure the child can hear. Um, not only that, they're going to try to find out because that child is not developing properly. That's the same thing. As the church, we have to make sure that we are developing properly. The, the whole co concept of grace isn't just, and a lot of Christians, honestly, have a misunderstanding of grace. Most people think that grace is a condom to sin. They think that grace gives them the allegiance. They give gives them the allowance. They think it's a raincoat that they put on before they go run and splash and sin. Grace is was never designed for you to go out here and do what you want. The whole purpose of grace was to cover you as you grow. The whole purpose of grace is to cover you as you grow. So, for example, if you know my story, I was in the club. I was in the world. I dealt with a lot of trauma growing up. I had a really broken mindset. I would, the way that I thought, the way that I reasoned, grace, the purpose of grace wasn't for me to come into the kingdom and remain in that mindset. But now I have salvation to go blah, 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 to the devil. Now I can do what I want to do. I, I can do all the stuff that, you know, I learned to do when I was in the world and you can't touch me. Oh no, because you will reap what you sow. The purpose of it was God understood that I was a babe in Christ. I had an appetite. I had come out of the world. The only thing I knew was trauma, sin, and sin. That's it. That's what I knew. I knew dysfunction. And so the Lord gives grace because he understands that I'm not going to come or a person is not going to come into the kingdom and automatically get it right. It's not going to come into the, uh, they're not going to come into the kingdom and automatically get it right. It took me years. It took me years. Because not only did I have to unlearn many behaviors, I had to learn new, new behaviors. I um, mean, at the same time, there was so much dying that I had to do. There was so much dying that I had to do. And then for myself personally, I didn't necessarily have people around me um, until I got like deep into my journey. I didn't have people around me that were really mentoring me. For the most part, I was trying to figure it out alone. I was going to church, but I was trying to figure it out alone. But that's the purpose of grace. The purpose of grace is to cover you as you grow. The purpose of grace is not for you to sit back and say, well, now I'm saved. I can go back and I can just, uh, you know, I can sleep with him. I can go to the club. I can get drunk. That is not the purpose of grace. Whenever you get into that kind of behavior, when you know it's wrong, there's a stage where it is no longer you're just a babe in Christ. There's a stage when it becomes rebellion. No different than a child. When a child is an infant, when a child is a newborn, that child, wow, well, it cries and cries and cries. There's a stage where you expect that of a child. There is nothing really, you can't, discipline. the child can't really understand a lot of the words that you speak. So the only thing that you're going to do is you're going to pop a teat in the, bow, the baby's mouth, or you're going to try to find, you're going to rock the baby. You're going to do whatever you can to soothe the baby, right? 
But then there comes a, a time where the child understands the word be quiet. Thank you, Sister Theodosia. God bless you. There comes a, a time when a child understands the word be quiet, shut up, go to your room. Once the child understands, the child now can be disciplined. Now, I'm not in, I'm not talking about corporal punishment. I'm not against corporal punishment, just like I'm not against it. But it depends on the child or it depends on, you know, what you feel is necessary in that moment as according to God, according to the word. So there comes a time with a one-year-old, you can say, be quiet. Because that one-year-old, in most cases, understands. They've heard that, that child has heard that word, heard that phrase, be quiet. So many times the child understands it. By the time, time that child is two. Now, one-year-old, you may sit back. A lot of parents with a one-year-old, they may pop on hand. They may give them a little pop. Doesn't hurt the child. It hurts the child's feelings. Or they may sit back and say, you know, take something from the child or what have you and completely ignore the child while the child throws a tantrum. At the end of the day, what you're doing is you're saying, now you understand. And because you now understand, I cannot give you the same grace I gave you when you were three months old. Y'all catching that? Y'all catching that? I can't give you the same grace that I gave you when you were three months old. I can't give you the same grace I gave you when you were a month old. You're now a year old. And so now you understand. So I want you to understand that. I want you to, I want you to pull that or, or, or marry that to the whole concept of being a babe in Christ. It's no different. There's a stage when you understand that fornication is wrong. When you first come into the body of Christ, when you first get saved, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. And God gives you grace for that because you don't understand why you're not supposed to do it. You don't understand how to stop doing it. You may need deliverance. There's grace for that. But there comes a there comes a stage when, it, when it's no longer you acting as a babe in Christ. There comes a stage when it becomes full-blown rebellion. And the Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Because now at this stage, now, when you get to that stage, your discipline, your discipline is different. When you get to that stage, your discipline is different because you know better. You know it's wrong, yet you choose to do it. When it gets to that place, when it becomes rebellion, chances are it's idolatry. Chances are it's idolatry. And when it gets to the stage of idolatry, check this out. I don't care if you're Christian. I don't care if you go to church. You, you, you're, you're operating in a form of bow worship. Because you're you're trying to, you're polytheistic in your nature. You're trying to worship God all the while worshiping yourself. Don't worry, I'm gonna get into the message. That's not where I want to go, but I'm just want I'm just making sure that I'm led by the Holy Spirit. But it there comes a stage where it's rebellion. There comes a stage where it's it's is you being polytheistic because in that moment you you're choosing to serve multiple gods. And check this out: you're trying to make the Most High God submit and surrender to your flesh or your demons whatever it is that you are struggling with you're trying to most make force the most high god and what you're trying to do is you're trying to put him in the back seat of your preferences you're trying to put him in the back seat and consequently what then happens is can two walk together except they be agreed god doesn't agree with you you don't agree with him consequently god exits exits the vehicle you leave him he doesn't leave you now the bible said he will never leave nor forsake you there's a stage where his grace is sufficient that's all you're going to get he, he will extend his grace but i want you to understand the concept or the law of sowing and reaping is just that it is a law it will bite you and a lot of times a lot of you what you're suffering through is not the devil attacking you what you're su suffering through is you keep trying to cast down your harvest. You keep trying to cast out your harvest. You keep on trying to sit back and whatever a man sow, that shall he also reap. Whatever seed you sow in this season, they will await you as a harvest in the next season. And a lot of times what we do is we sow evil seeds, we sow bad seeds, but this is today a many Christians, a lot of believers, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna warn you. A lot of, a lot of you, your problem is you think that dancing is going to break it off of you. You think that shouting is going to break it off of you. A law is just that, a law. You're the law of gravity. So whatever comes up is going to come down. It's a law. So a law is absolute. Whatever it is that you do, whatever man sow, it's a law. You're going to reap it. Doesn't matter how good of a Christian you are. You're going to reap what you sow. Because I want you to catch this concept. The Garden of Eden, 
you have your own personal garden. And it may not necessarily be the Garden of Eden, but it is your personal Garden of Eden. And what you're doing with your decisions, with your choices, is that you're actually putting seed in the ground. Every single day, you're putting seed in the ground. Every the words that you speak are seeds. The life, the, the, the things that you do, they're all seeds. What you don't do, there are seeds. Everything you're putting it in the ground. And in the next season, season, there's going to be a harvest. Another revelation. Whatever seed you put on the, in the ground is going to determine which garden you're sowing into. So there's the, the garden from the kingdom of God, and there's one from the enemy. And if you sow discord, if you sow, uh, if you sow for anger, rebellion, sex outside of marriage, you're sowing it in the, in the kingdom of darkness. Do not, do not, do not expect a good harvest from these seeds. I can't, I, man, don't expect a good harvest from the seed sown over here. Now, whatever, remember, one man plants, another waters, but it is God that gives the increase. That is for this particular seed kingdom. Over here, the kingdom of darkness is very similar. One man plants, another waters. But the enemy is going to make sure that you get the increase of that. How is he going to do that? Through accusation. So if you sit back here and let's say you start playing with sage and getting into con demonic contracts, then I don't care if you say in the name of Jesus while playing with that stuff, you're sowing it into the wrong kingdom. Because the, the Bible, you cannot sow that into the kingdom of God. The Bible is explicitly against witchcraft. There's no way to dress it up. There's no way to perfume it. There's no way to doll it up at the end of the day. The, the Bible is against witchcraft. So you cannot take something and, and, and put the name Jesus on it and think that that's going to legalize you to sow it into the kingdom of God. It is illegal behavior. So it has to be sown over here. Now, when you say the name of Jesus over here, you're going to upset demons. What the devil don't tell you is that when you're sowing seeds over here, then there's going to be demons that you legalize because the seeds have to have, um, these are going to be your gardeners of sorts. These are going to be the ones, and they're going to be the ones that accuse you. Whatever you put in the ground, you have to reap it. Whatever you put in the ground, you have to reap it. So if you want to, if you want to have a good harvest, you want to always sow over here. You want to sow in the kingdom. You want to make sure that you're praying. That's a seed. You want to make sure that you're fasting. That's a seed. You want to make sure that you are uh, that you're, you're you're being kind to people. That you're, you're that you are growing the fruits of the of the spirit. These are all seeds, and you want to make sure that they're watered. As a matter of fact, if I put those seeds in the ground, one man plants, God's going to send somebody to water those seeds. If I put those seeds in the ground, God's going to send somebody to water them. And so, check this out. If I want. For those of you, let's just stop here real quick. Just a little exit for the sisters and for the brothers. For those of you who are single, if you want a spouse, sow over here. Sow the right seeds. If you're not, and you got to get delivered from thinking that the right seed is you going to get your hair done. You got to get delivered from thinking that the right seed is you sitting up there and just saying, well, let me put on some extra uh, eyeliner this week. No, that's not the right seed. You can do all of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to sow the seeds. This is the message. You're going to need this to qualify for the season that you're entering. The seed is a sacrifice. I want you to write that in capital letters. Write the word sacrifice. Because in order for you to exit any season that you're in, you have to be willing to make a sacrifice. In order for you to enter any season that you're in, the Lord, had, the Lord brought this to my heart today. I was thinking about this while I was driving to church. Um. I thought about, or was I coming back from church? I don't know. But I thought about, for example, um, couples. I've, I've done many, I've done many counseling sessions with couples, married couples. And one of the things I found is that one of the issues that started bringing, you guys know, I always say this, that God typically throw, uh, sends couples. I don't want to say throw. I always say throw, but because I prefer not to minister to couples, you know, because for me, I'm twice divorced. It's not that I don't feel qualified. It's just that at, at this particular stage, you know, I feel better sending them to somebody else. Nevertheless, when God sends them my way, I would do like an initial maybe one or two sessions with them. And then I will send them off to somebody that's been married uh, for like 30 and 40 years. I'll send them off to other people to counsel them or what have you. I'll say, hey, these people have been married 30 and 40 years, follow through with them because you got a whole man. 
and you need your man needs to talk to a man, you know. But one of the things I've seen, because the Bible says before, before you build a thing, you must count the cost. Sister Shantae, thank you for the seed. God bless you. You must count the cost. One of the things I've seen that always leads to a lot of friction in marriage is that one person goes in putting seed in like crazy. Another person comes in and all they want to do is harvest. They, they come in like, oh, I like this whole concept of marriage. I like all this. But they don't really want to sacrifice anything. They don't want to give anything. One person comes in as a giver. The other person comes in as a taker. In my experience, now it can be the man or the female. In my experience, most of the times is the man that's, you know, trying to reap and a woman is so and so and so on. Consequently, she gets frustrated because she set the stage for that. That's a whole other message. Uh, but she set the stage for that because in the dating phase and the courting phase, she allowed that and it created an expectation with that guy. And he didn't see anything wrong with it. But before you build a thing, you must count the cost. One of the things I got a chance to see is that a lot of times, you know, the guy, for example, will be sitting there looking like, you know, I, 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 she she don't want me to go nowhere. You know, um, she don't want me to go nowhere. I was trying. I was out with my friends the other night and I'm like, how long were you out? I mean, I came home at one. I said, it's disrespectful. How is that disrespectful? I had a life before I got right. You had a life before you got with her. Did you count the cost of marriage? Did you count the cost? So did and first and foremost, I have to ask her, did y'all even discuss it? Did you discuss what was considered good versus bad? Because you probably would have decided not to marry that person had you talked to them and realized that they weren't willing to make a, a, a compromise. They weren't willing to make a sacrifice. Did you count the cost before you got in there? This is what sets the stage for the destruction of so many relationships and so many of the things that you guys are building. It sets the stage for it is because you have to make a sacrifice but in order to make a sacrifice, you got to count the cost. You got to make the decision. Is it worth it to me? Now, somebody else is going to say it's worth it. But you have to say, is it worth it to me? You have to make the sacrifice. And I have to say to that guy, I said, yeah, that, that's disrespectful. Because you're supposed to be the protector of your home. What if somebody broke into your home? Well, ain't nobody going to break. We got a ring camera. We got this. But can ring fight? Can ring do all of those things? That's disrespectful. You're supposed to give that up. Before you got married, you, you're supposed to talk about that, discuss that, give that up before you got married. If you weren't willing to give that up, then check this out. It doesn't mean that you weren't supposed to get married. You just probably should have married somebody else. Because the wife that you have, she's normal. There are women out there who they, they're completely and that's their version of normal. They're completely okay with you coming home two, three, four in the morning. Because they're going to do it. And then you're going to fight with them for doing it. Why are you coming? Ain't nothing out open this time of night but legs. Why are you all out there in the street at two? It don't look right for a wife to come home at two, three in the morning. Did you count the cost? What sets the stage for the destruction of so much of what it is that you're believing God for is you're not counting the cost. You're not counting it. I recently had this, I, the Lord dealt with me and he started dealing with me about marriage. He said, count the cost. And he said, Tiffany, I need you to pay attention to the season that you're in. I need you to make sure that you pay attention. Don't think ahead because this is the problem with so many people is when you're in today, you're living in a prayer. This is the manifestation of a, an answered prayer. I'm living in this. I'm living in an answered prayer. But when you live in an answer prayer, you're so caught up in the moment that you're not present in it. That what happens is you don't appreciate the moment. Consequently, you start thinking ahead. See, you're borrowing time from your future. You're borrowing is. So you're thinking ahead. You're thinking about what, what's ahead or what have you. When you get ahead, when you finally get to that season, you run into disappointment. Because in the season before, you were thinking ahead, and you know what? You weren't present in that season, and now everything doesn't look the way that it looked in your head. So you know what you do? Consequently, you start looking back. Man, 
I wish I had a, a, a pre, I had a, a preach appreciated my single season all the more. I wish I had appreciated the time when I didn't have any kids. You know, I could have traveled the world back then. I could have did this. How many of you can relate to that? How many of you can relate to that? You sat back and you were thinking so far up ahead. You then became a wife. You became a mother. You became all of these things. And now you look sometimes and you're like, I didn't appreciate that season that I was in. I took it for granted. If I could go back, okay, I, an example, another example. I think I talked about this on my podcast. Another example I have, I lived in Florida for five years. And for about a year and a half of that time, I was divorced. You know, went through a divorce. I say about two years. About two years, I, I was single there. Two, about two years. I regret that I did not utilize that time properly. I was too busy thinking ahead. When I got the prophetic word that the Lord is saying he's going to move you to Georgia, I was so caught up in Georgia that I did not appreciate Florida. I was so excited about Georgia and what I thought that Georgia was going to bring, what I thought that Georgia was going to look like, because mind you, I had visited Georgia before, but I didn't go outside when I visited it, you know, probably to the store or what have you, but I had never really been in Georgia, like outside in Georgia. I didn't realize the gold that I was living in. Most people want to live in Florida. And I, here it was. And I kept saying to myself, I'm going to make it down to the beach and I'm going to take some cruises. I'm going to take some cruises because down in Florida, you can take uh, like dolphin cruises. I lived in St. Petersburg and I used to go with my ex. We used to take these uh, dolphin cruises and it, these are one hour, an hour and a half cruises. And at that time they were like 60 bucks. I don't know if you know, inflation, if it's higher now, but they were like 60 bucks and they take you out on the lake and what have you. And I, I even planned to take a dinner cruise. I think a dinner cruise is like an hour and a half, two hours where you get on a cruise ship and you're on the water and then you're going to eat, you know, fancy dinner and all that. In the single, in my time of singleness, I didn't do it. I didn't because I kept thinking I had more time to do it. I kept thinking that I had more time to do it. Consequently, I was so thinking ahead to Georgia and all these prophetic words. Y'all, let me tell you something. I'm going to give you a little bit of revelation. Let God bring prophecy to you. Don't chase it. I, I won't say I was chasing it. Let me, let me back up on that. I won't say I was chasing it. I started getting prophetic words about what my next season was going to look like. And what it did was it made me anxious because I wasn't mature. It made me anxious. So consequently, I went from being content to anxious. I went from being content. I started thinking about what my next season, what Georgia was going to bring. You know, I kept getting these prophetic words that, oh, your husband there, you're going to meet your husband and all of this stuff. I wasn't thinking about no man. I had just went through a divorce. I wasn't thinking about no man. That's not where my head or my heart was. It wasn't on a guy. And nevertheless, I started getting those prophetic words. So you know what it did? It made me want to move to Georgia all the more. I'm looking up places. I'm not even present in the moment. I had the whole spread of Florida in front of me. Not to say I didn't enjoy myself in Florida. I did photo shoots and I, I got out a little bit. It wasn't until probably about a month before I left Florida, that I actually started enjoying Florida. It was a month before I left Florida that I actually started enjoying it. A month. I, I reconnected with an, a former friend of mine and I already had my friend, I already had a friend there that I was hanging out with. We used to always hang out like, but she would, you know, she knew I was an introvert. So she knew I did my daddy daughter dates every um, Saturday and um, she would come like, so four times a month, she would come twice a month. She would typically come twice a month. You know, we hung out, we walked together and all that other stuff. Then this other, this other uh, um, female that I used to hang out with, I sat back, Sister Eve, thank you. God bless you, sis. God bless you. I appreciate you. I, I started uh, hanging out with this other uh, sister in Christ. And we were having a blast. We started going out, you know, she wanted to go to every daddy daughter date with me. 
And so we started going out to really, that was my first time going to Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Um, and I had a powerful story about that. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but I remember going to Ruth Chris Steakhouse. I didn't know I was called to deliverance at the time. And in Ruth Chris Steakhouse, me and this girl, we're sitting across from each other. You know, we're talking and what have you, we're having a good time. Waitress comes over and she starts talking about, um, you guys got an aura. You have an aura about you. And when she said aura, we looked at each other and we're just like, oh, okay. And so we're talking. So we realize the child is in a witchcraft and she starts talking about chakras. This is our waitress and stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, you're going to have to interrupt her. This is your assignment. So I interrupt and I start talking and I said, you know, uh, no. And I start, I don't know what I said. I don't remember everything I said, but what I do remember is that I started telling her that it was witchcraft. It was demonic. And, you know, I started telling her, you know, the price to pay for that, you know, the stuff. And, you know, I was real kind. And I remember the girl started manifesting. It was a light manifestation, but she began to manifest. She started getting fidgety and she had goosebumps. And she was like, I'm getting, I don't know why I'm getting, who I feel terrified. I don't know why I feel terrified. I just, I'm getting these goosebumps. It right there at the edge of me leaving Florida, that started happening. I was, I'm talking to her. My sister in Christ was talking to her. And, you know, the more we talked, the more she, she started getting fidgety. She started getting fidgety. So consequently, when the time came for me to move, I'm still too excited to be present in the moment. I can't stop thinking about Georgia. I can't stop thinking about when I got to Georgia, disappointment, 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 disappointment. It took me two years to stop looking back. The Lord kept telling me, he said, daughter, stop looking back. Two years, I would Google weather in Florida, especially if it got cold here. I just kept regretting. I kept thinking about how we had sidewalks. I could walk my dog. The people were chipper. You know, uh, the people were like, top of the morning to you. I'm like, hey, good morning. You know, they come out, they're like, they're just all excited. Everybody wearing lime green, pink, and orange, and yellows, and everybody's just happy. Then I come to Georgia, and everybody was like, you going yet? No. It was a culture shock for me. It was a culture shock. Well, I'm saying that I wasn't present in the moment. And this is what happens to you is that the reason that you get frustrated, the reason that you get anxious, the reason you keep trying to hijack your next season is because you're not present in the moment. This is why the Bible says, take no thought for tomorrow, but sufficient, sufficient for today is the trouble thereof. The Bible also says, be anxious for nothing. I left because the Lord told me to. The Lord told me that he was moving me to Georgia. Uh, I kept getting prophetic words that the Lord was moving me to Georgia. So that's the reason I moved here. I moved here on a prophecy, on, 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 on prophetic words um, because of my assignment. You know, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be transparent with you. I've secretly and really hoped many times that it would have turned out to be a false prophecy. Because I tell you right now, I sell half of what I got and, and move right back because I love that place so much. I've always wanted to live in Florida my whole life. I've always wanted to live in there, but I had to learn that the, the, the thing that I'm saying is, is you got to be present in a moment because if you're not present in a moment, you will trip over your sacrifice. If you're not present in a moment, you won't do what God told you to do in the moment because you're too busy living in tomorrow. I told you guys this and I'll get back into the message. I remember I started having what I believe to be visions of after I got the prophetic word, I had this vision of a man, this vision of a man. And I can't even believe that was my husband. Oh God, I was, listen, listen. The child was beautiful. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna be transparent. The child was beautiful. And I was sitting up there and I believed that that was him. So I started getting caught up in my thought. This is, and for those of you who daydream a lot, Take that, take that creativity and put it in a book. Take that creativity because creativity can become craziness if you don't come out of it. It, it, it. it can take you down crazy street. I used to take these naps every single day. Matter of fact, I don't know if I started taking them then, but because I had this vision or what I thought was a vision a couple of times, 
I would run my happy tail. I was happy when the time came. When I felt sleepy, I'm like, yay, I'll go run to the bed because I would I would utilize that time because typically whenever I would go to sleep back then, I used to have to occupy my mind with thoughts. Like I had to think of something until I fell asleep. Nowadays, I have to kind of clear my mind. But I would occupy my mind with thoughts about what it was going to be like in Georgia and how I was going to meet this guy and all of these different things. Everything seemed so... So what it did was it made me more anxious. Take no thought for tomorrow. If it's sufficient, sufficient for today is the trouble thereof. It made me more anxious about the about Georgia. It made me more anxious about Georgia. The Lord then told me, one day the Lord said, I need you to divorce that. And I was like, well, he said, I need you to divorce that. I need you to divorce this man in your thoughts. I need you to divorce that image. I'm going to give you a little bit of revelation. Do me a favor, like and share. Like and share. I'm going to give you a little bit of revelation why he told me to do that. He said, I need you to divorce that image. I need you to break up with that image. I need you to stop doing that. And I'm going to tell you something. You can create a one-sided soul tie with a creature that does not even exist. A person that doesn't exist that going in your head. That wasn't an easy thing because I, I started relying on that to go to sleep. It was, and I, I kept it Christian, right? I would try to keep it Christian. I would just imagine in, be, being in Georgia, sitting in the car, because he couldn't come in my house because, you know, be wrapped in flesh or what have you. But he would be sitting in my car and, you know, or I'd be sitting in his car and, you know, we just sit there, out there in the car. We just talking this nighttime. We're talking or what have you. I had all of these things playing out in my head. I understood why. I understand now what God said. Take no thought for tomorrow, for sufficient for the day is the trouble thereof. That right there could destroy your faith. That right there could make you completely oblivious to the world in front of you. It can also make you start anticipating somebody that may not, may or may not be the one that God brought. It, it, it could do a lot of damage to you. It could do a lot of damage. I would get in my head and think about that. And that's how I would go myself to sleep. For my nap and for the time I went to bed, I went to bed like six, seven in the morning when I went to bed. That was what I did. I would think about this guy. I would think about this guy. Consequently, true story. True story. One day I'm scrolling the internet. I've told you guys this story before. I'm scrolling the internet. I happen to see a dude look just like him. I dare not drop my phone. I dare not drop my phone. Thankfully, I had divorced the image by then, but I was still like... I had to learn, Tiffany, use your creativity, your imagination. Let that partner with your creativity. Don't go in your head and think about, I don't know who need to hear that. Don't go in your head and think about tomorrow. Don't do that. Don't go in your head and think about what it's going to be like. Many of you, that sets you up for the wrong man. Because you start talking to a man and you know what you do? You jump ahead. You ain't talked to him two days and you're already up ahead in your imagination. You're already up ahead. You had kids. You already started thinking about, you know, all of this. And he ain't even the right one. He ain't even the right one. So it becomes harder to let him go when you realize he's not the right one simply because you already started making plans. You're making investments in your mind. It becomes harder to let him go because you've already thought about what life would be like with him and children and all of that. You've already planned trips and all that other stuff. You, you've already jumped ahead in your mind. You have to be present in the moment. So this is the word that the Lord laid on my heart for you. The Lord reminded me of my life. I've had to make a ton of sacrifices over the course of my life. A ton of them, like major, not, not minor sacrifices. Not that, you know, um, the Lord told me to stop sneezing out of my, life, my left nostril, so I just start sneezing out of my right nostril type stuff. Not that, you know, um, no, I'm talking about major sacrifices. I'm going to tell you something I've learned and something I've noticed. People who intentionally, and I need you to hear this clearly. I need you to just pay attention. Whatever you're doing, stop what you're doing and listen closely. People who intentionally make sacrifices for God. And I'm talking about minor or major, especially the major ones. Now, what's major is, is, is determined by how you value a thing. But people who intentionally make sacrifices for God who sit back, and I'm talking about something you have to grieve. I ain't, I'm not talking about, the Lord said, you know, 
Don't get that pink pair of shoes. Get the blue ones. Or don't get you no shoes today. That's a sacrifice. That's good. You've been obeying God. There's a harvest atta attracted to that. There's a harvest attached to that. But people who intentionally obey God for the big things. The Bible says it this way. If you're faithful over little, I'll make you ruler over much. That means consistent. Consistent. But the people who make the sacrifices, they typically reap a big harvest. The people who make major sacrifices, I'm talking about careers, cities, states. The people who make major sacrifices typically will attract a big harvest. The problem with today's average Christian, and the message here is stop being average. The problem with today's average Christian is they're not willing to make a sacrifice. Most of the depression, anxiety, frustration that you have is nothing but you having an adult-sized temper tantrum because the, God, because the Lord is requiring something of you to enter into your next season. The Lord is playing tug of war. Maybe he's playing tug of war on that dude that you like, and now you're frustrated. Rather than let go and say, God, your will be done. Because if God has to snatch it from you, it's not a seed. If it has to burn your hands before you let go, it's not a seed. It's only a seed when you sow it. It's only a seed when you sow it. When you sow in tears, you will reap in joy. It's only a seed. And typically, listen, the greatest, most potent seeds are the ones you sow in tears. The greatest, most potent seeds. Excuse me, tears are the ones you sow in the seeds are the ones you sow in tears. These are the sacrifices that God requires of you because what he's trying to do, and I want you to hear me on this, he's trying to get you to sacrifice how you see yourself, your pretty self. He's trying to get you to sacrifice your plans so that his plans can prevail in your life. Because God will watch you sit there and make all these beautiful plans. He'll let you do it. He'll let you build a tower of Babel in your life. And then he'll turn around and confuse your language. They built that thing for a hundred. They built that thing for a hundred years. A lot of people don't know that. They built that thing for a hundred years. He will let you build, put another rock on it and show up at the construction site day after day. Because most of you, you build in here. It's the plans that you make. You build and this, you build this, and you build that, and you build, you build, you build, you build, you build, you build, you keep building. And then one day the Lord says, Now that you finish building your golden calf, I need you to sacrifice it. Now that you finish building your golden calf, Sister George Ann, thank you. I love you. Thank you. Now that you got your golden calf erected, I want you to kill it. I don't know if y'all know if that's how God is. God will let you build all of those plans for yourself. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to have his babies. We're going to move here. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And he'll let you build that thing for years. He'll let you date him for years. He'll let you, you go in the sea and have babies with him. It doesn't matter. Two, three kids. Just because you made sacrifices for the, the calf doesn't mean that God's going to let you keep it. And then one day, God will require it of you. One day, he will require that of you. One day, he'll be like, okay, let it go. And if you can't, if you struggle, it's the, you're, you're discovering the reason he's telling you to let it go. is because it has become an idol. It has become your God. You worship it. You place it before God. Say, God said, you shall have no other gods before me. You will require that of you. I had to learn to stop building here and start just doing what God told me to do. Period, point blank. Just live in the moment. Live in the moment. It saved me from disappointment. It saved me from a bunch of unnecessary hurt to live in the moment. Today, before I came on here, I had two logo orders. I, listen, I gave myself 15 minutes because they're already designed. All I had to do was put the text on them. I gave myself 15, 20 minutes to do those so I can come on here. 
when I get over here, I have a ton of things to do, a thousand things to do. But of all these things that I have to do, these are sacrifices. I don't feel like doing a lot of this stuff that I'm that's on my plate to do. I, I genuinely wholeheartedly just don't feel like it. But this is the thing. What am I doing? All of this is me sowing seeds into my next season. Because I want you to get delivered from this belief that yo bio shekayada nama say is a seed. It's prayer. While well, prayer is seed. It's not going to create a harvest. It's not going to pr produce the harvest. It's not, well, let me say it this way. It does not replace sacrifice. It does not replace works. Faith without works is dead. It does not replace faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. It doesn't replace any of those things. You have to do the work. You got to put the work in. You got to sit up there. You got to study your Bible. You got to show up at church. You got to pray. You got to fast. You got to put in the time. You got to put in the effort. And whenever God requires something of you, you got to let it go. This is a little revelation I'm going to give you, especially those of you in your 20s and your early 30s. If you're in your 40s, you can still take this. But this is really going to deal with the 20s and the 30s all the way up to like 35. This is going to bless your life. Stop building in your head. When you're young, you use a lot of your imagination. You spend a lot of time here. Take it out of here and put it on paper. Write the vision and make it plain. Take it out of here and put it on paper. Take it out of here and bring it to life. Don't spend time. If I can give you any revelation, if I can speak to the 20-year-old me, I would have told me to get saved. If I can speak to the 20-year-old me, I would have told me, don't put your mind on a man. Not right now. Go get healed. Go get healed, sis. Go get healed. Focus, build. Find, find out who you are in the kingdom. Do what your, your assignment. You have an assignment in the kingdom. Find out what that is. Your husband will find you in there. Your husband will find you in the will of God. He will find you there. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Catch this. Any other dude is going to be blind. You're going to spend quite a bit of time trying to open his eyes. Don't do that. Your assignment is to get into, but that requires a sacrifice. Getting into your assignment it requires a sacrifice. It does. It requires you getting off from work and maybe serving at your church. Studying your word when you don't feel like it. That time when you sit up on the phone with, with your friend Keisha and y'all usually talk for hours on end, you need to give that time over to the Lord. Give Keisha 20 minutes and get off that phone because there ain't nothing y'all need to talk about that take that long. Have conversations. Conversations last that long whenever you get a catch-up conversation. Have a catch-up conversation once a week. That's it. Spend your time in the face of the king. You are here for a purpose. Make the necessary sacrifices. 20 year old and 30 year olds, I'm gonna tell you right now, I, I, I said this, I tell this to people all the time. I said, if I could reclaim that age, or even, even I call it the baby body, because right then and there, your adrenaline is still through the roof. If I can go back and get the, get the baby body I had and put my brain in her, you can tell me nothing. If I can go back to that age and that stage and have the mind that I have, Oprah would be calling me to borrow money. I would be healed. I would be whole. I would have done all of those things young. I wouldn't have waited until I got into my 30s and my 40s to go on a journey because that's what most people do. You get 35, then all of a sudden you start thinking, you start thinking about healing after you that hurt like 18 folk. If I had done that young, I would have been unstoppable. You would have been unstoppable. It's not too late, thank the Lord. I went on a journey. I started on, I started getting my healing. I started on that journey in my 30s. 
Y'all, I had to be intentional. I had to stop looking because this is where maturity comes in. I had to stop thinking about wanting somebody to be a blessing to me. And I had to start thinking about wanting to be a blessing. I had the desire to be a blessing. I had to stop thinking about, I want somebody to hug me. I want somebody to hold me. I want this and I want that. I, me, I, no, 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 no. No marriage will work out like that. No friendship will work out like that. You know why? Because God allowed me to have a bunch of I, me, and I's in my life. And you know what? It got frustrating as heck because I had all them folks around me and I'm sitting here looking like, y'all, you takers, consumers. All you want is to see what you can get. I got tired of that. I got tired of saying you're welcome. I wanted to say thank you as well. Can I say thank you? I got frustrated with it. every time I look up. I'm always the one saying, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. No. I'm saying that to say this season, and I'm getting ready to close. This season, I want you to take into account what is it that the Lord has been placing on your heart that you're going to have to let go of. Is it that friend? Let me give you a little revelation. Let me, let me make it a little easier for you. For those of you who say the Lord has been warning me about some people in my life, you don't have to cut her off. You just have to outgrow her. That's, that's how you make that sacrifice. You don't have to necessarily cut people off. I learned this. You just have to outgrow them. You set boundaries, period, point blank. Sis, I don't, got, I don't gossip no more. I don't gossip anymore. Um, so she called you and said, girl, did you hear such and such? Let's pray for her. Bow your head. Girl, I'm just so tired. People just be, sis, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you complain. I am not your toilet. I love you. But sis, you and God have been way too good. I said that to an old friend of mine. Old friend, that started the that started the benediction. That was the benediction of our friendship. When I told her, I said, sis, I'm not going to sit up and listen to you complain anymore. God's been far too good to you for you to sit up and be so negative. You know, there are neg there's some of you on here, you're too negative. You know why? Because you live in tomorrow. And every time you live in tomorrow, by the time you arrive at tomorrow, you're disappointed because you didn't set up there. Because when you or when you when you put your head in tomorrow, when you keep thinking about tomorrow and what it's going to look like, then what you do is you start actually adding on to it because you're going to get bored and it sets the stage for disappointment. What is it that the Lord is requiring of you in this season? So so that you can go into the next season. Thank you, Sister Delana. God bless you. What is he asking of you? That's right. Friend calling for free coaching and therapy. That's not a friend. That's a mentee. Put the right label on it. The right, the right label. Because right then and there, people will always give you a wrong label so they can extract from you. I learned that. I, I deal with that in my book, Relational Acuity. I can't wait to release it. I just hired some more people to do artwork. I hired two people to do covers for the book. I didn't like the covers that they did. So I hired somebody else to do artwork um, for it. So I'm going to see how that turns out. Prayerfully, that turns out really good. But what is it that God is requiring of you? Let's talk business. Some of you are called to be entrepreneurs. And you know it. But the problem is, the reason that you are not an entrepreneur right now is because you're not doing things in excellence. You cheat. You ever heard that, 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 that saying, that adage, you have to spend money to make it? The adage is relatively true. It's just a little off. It's really, you have to invest money. You have to do things in excellence, period, point blank. And nobody going to be willing to invest more in your business than you are. You invest, if you believe in your product, you believe in your business, then you do the best of the best for it. That I mean, you got to sacrifice that money. You go to your, 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 your nine to five job, and then you're going to have to sacrifice some of that money. You're going to you're gonna take some of that money, and I'm going to tell you right now, you need a website, you're going to have a choice. You're going to look, and you're going to say, I can get it professionally done, but that's going to hit me up a grand or more. Or I can get a little peewee to do it. His website was busted, but you know what? He did a couple of them, and I saw some cute corners on them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have peewee. 
then I'm a controller. You know how many church folks do that? My goodness, I listen. <laughs> I am God taught as a designer. Goodness gracious, the hell I went through in the beginning. People that didn't want to go pay to pay somebody else to do their logo, they would hire me when I didn't really understand. And they'll just try to control your hand. Go back at it again. You almost got it. Ma'am, I've been working for you three weeks for $33. The devil is a lie. Thank you, one God. God bless you. That's what people do. Instead of paying people that, paying people and just making a sacrifice, what they do is they sit back and they take, well, let me, I'm just gonna get, I'm just gonna get Pee Wee a hard time. I'm gonna get Pee Wee, I'm gonna get Pee Wee 40 bucks. I'm gonna take him to McDonald's and I'm gonna give him a hard time. That's why you got so many people that they start off in graphic design or other businesses and they run out of it. After they done dealt with cheap folks. They don't want to go pay somebody $300, $400, $500 and they find you. You like $20. Like, I remember mentoring a girl and ministering to, I won't say mentoring, ministering to a young lady some years ago. And this is when I was still kind of new to everything. But by this time, I had kind of got, you know, a little bit of, uh, 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 I got really good. Thank you, Sister Chelsea. God bless you. Got really good at what I was doing and what have you. And I had a steady clientele. And she used to do Facebook banners. The sister was skilled. She would take your picture. She did, did do this oil paint thing with it. She put this background on it. All this. The girl was skilled. The girl was, she was skilled. And man, she was a babe in Christ just coming into the kingdom. Remember she told me she had lived an alternate lifestyle or what have you. I felt bad because she started working with church folk. And it was sending her. It was sending the child. Sister Cara, thank you. God bless you. It was sending her. And she was like, I was talking to this lady and she paid me $10 for the banner. And she, you know, I, I've been working on that banner for two weeks. I said, close that order. Close it. She keeps telling me to change it. She keeps, I said, girl, welcome to the world of spirit. I, you're dealing with Jezebel. What she described, I said, you're dealing with Jezebel. I'm sorry. When you come into this, when you first start off and you lower your prices, Jezebels are the roaches. These, this is the projects of mindset. Then you're going to deal with low, the worst Jezebels are the cheap ones. The ones who can't even afford to have an Ahab. So they have to go out there and they got to borrow people. They got to borrow Ahabs every now and then. They got to come to a restaurant and talk to people like they're crazy. Can't even afford to go to a $60 restaurant or a $50 restaurant, but they're in the middle of McDonald's. I said no lettuce. Ma'am, there's no lettuce on there. What's that green thing? That's a pickle. Take it off. I don't want any pickles either. That's what they call the Karen. It's a Jezebel. It's a Jezebel. A Jezebel without an Ahab. She can't afford to have an Ahab, so she got to go out there and she got to find her little cheap Ahabs. That's why when you start off in business, that's why it's always good to have a coach. So they can give you language for it. They can help you out. So anyhow, let me get ready to close this. In this, just remember this, in this new season, as you're entering, it's just a change of mind. Remember, a season is a mindset. It's just a change of mind. It's, there's a time element to it because it's the time in which you're locked in the mindset. Once God opens up uh, the next season, he's not opening up just all of a sudden, I'm in an uh, uh, open heaven. That's That can happen. But open heaven just means ideas. Sister Kia, God bless you. Thank you, sis. That's all it means is ideas. Faith without works is dead. You can have the idea and not do anything with it. You know how I many people sit under an open heaven and just sit on a toilet? Ain't did nothing. God gave you a book idea. Mm -hmm. Girl, Jesus. Yeah, this is why you don't, this is why I don't occupy my phone line with people who are not doing nothing. Because they got too much time on their hands. Why you answer your phone? Because I'm busy. And I ain't your, I'm not your old lady. Now, if you're a dude and we dating, or we all that, that's a different thing. We're gonna talk. Other than that, and I still we ain't gonna bury it. But other than that, now I'm not gonna sit up on the phone 
talking for hours on end about what? The fact that your 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 fart today smell like an apple, a rotten apple. Colon cleanse, girl, get off my phone with that. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. That's time. That time that you're doing, that you're sitting up and talking on the phone all day long for hours on end. Y'all ain't doing nothing but sitting around waiting on the Grim Reaper. That's it. You're just sitting around waiting on the Grim Reaper. You ain't doing nothing. That's time you could have been writing that book. So you got to sacrifice that time. You got to sacrifice your preference. You Trust me, as an entrepreneur, there are things I prefer to do every day. Every day. There are things I prefer to do. When I'm working, I am working on this project, that project. But a lot of times I have other things in my head. I can't wait to get to this. Once I finish this, I'm going to get to this. Then I have other projects come in, this come in. I had two local orders come in. Excuse me. I decided today, I said, let me go ahead and do that before I come down. But those are easy orders. But I'm saying I get orders in that I don't want to do. I tell I, I was telling um one of my mentees tonight, I said, I hate designing flyers. Don't please, I love you. Don't don't hire me to do a flyer. I'm pretty good at it. I just don't like doing them. If I get a flyer order in, I do this right here. If I get a website order in, I do the same thing. It depends. For the most part, I got too much on my plate. And sometimes, sometimes those things take expensive amounts of time. Flyer can do it about three hours. But I can do a logo a lot faster and make more money. What is God requiring of you in this season? You got to give up the old way of thinking. The lies you told yourself, you got to give up your victimhood. I don't know who need to hear this. That spirit of self-pity where you like people to feel sorry for you. You can't go nowhere with that spirit. That spirit is an anchor. It will not let you go anywhere. You can't walk around here pitying yourself. It's okay. Have a moment. But get up. You, you can't sit up there and just be waiting on folks and posting up sad Facebook statuses and pictures of you in a hospital. Want people to feel sorry for you? You are advertising for Jezebel when you do that. You're saying, Ahab here looking for a Jezebel. I relinquished my authority. It splattered all over my page. I'm frustrated. I don't want to do the hard work of life. If you will come and do everything for me, I'll let you control me. Develop them. I would tell you to get into a mentorship or something like that. Volunteer at your church and you'll start to find them as you are helping. When you're doing things, you'll find things that you love to do. When you come out there and you post up the Facebook, it's another one of those days, Facebook. Y'all pray for me. All you're doing is you're Ahab saying to Jezebel, hey, wounded soul over here. I'm over here feeling sorry for myself. Even though Jesus said I'm more than a conqueror in him, I'm choosing to be a victim today. Because today don't look the, the way I wanted it to look. So I'm sure on, I'm, I'm throwing an adult sized tantrum. I'm hoping I, since I can't get the Lord to feel sorry for me, I'm trying to get people to feel sorry for me. Because I don't want to do the hard work of living. I don't want to do the hard work that comes with uh, of, of, of me having to make a decision when me having to make a sacrifice. I don't want to do that. I want to go back to being a child. So Ahab is, it's just a big old baby. Jezebel come in and it's just an incestuous relationship. Person comes in, oh, okay, you 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 don't you, you don't feel like you got a person on your job yelling at you. Okay, you don't want to stand up for your your rights, you don't want to read the handbook, you don't want to pray. All right, I'll come up to your job. I do all the hard work for you. Why you sit around and be a wuss? I gotta be hard with you because I gotta get you out of that place. I am a living witness to this. God took me on a long journey. 
a long journey, a long one. You know, that's how it's funny. This is how I know when I first started going to my church. It was around the time when I first started going to my church, I started meeting the prophetess in my house. Um, when I met her, she was doing a book signing. Well, I didn't meet her then. I already met her. I think I'd been going there for a few months up to a year. But I remember I had never really had a conversation with her. And I went to the, you know, to, I was purchasing her book. She was doing a book signing. And I walked up to her and she said, hmm. And the Lord began to speak to her. She said, you've been on a long journey. When she said that word, I knew she was hearing from God. She said, you've been on a long, like you've been on this long journey. It was a word. It was a word that the Lord showed me when I got into the church, that that was a church. The Lord said, it wasn't necessarily the word journey. I had a vision of me crawling. God said, this is where I've been bringing you to. I was like on a long road. And I had a vision of me crawling. God said, this is where I was bringing, this is where I've been bringing you to. God has plans for you. But the fight isn't that the devil is attacking you. Sure, he attacks you. But the devil attacks you in the area of your desire. The problem is you're not willing to make the sacrifice. If you just be willing to make the sacrifice, does it hurt? Nowhere near as bad as you think it does, honestly. It hurts more here than it does out here, honestly. Every sacrifice I've ever had to make, it was more here. It was more here. Did it hurt on the outside? Yes, it hurt. It hurt, but I'm here. And my mind is intact. I have a sound mind. I have peace. I have a I have joy. I have God. Make whatever sacrifices you need to make in this season so you can enter into your next season. I had to make the sacrifice of Florida. And that wasn't the start of my sacrifices. Jesus. I don't, I ain't, I'm not going to even go beyond Florida because we'd be here all night if I tell you all the stuff I had to let go of, including a, a site. I remember building a site and it had a little bit of friction. Uh, it had gotten a little bit of popularity and all that other stuff. It was a hip hop artist and all that. And I was managing and the Lord said, the Lord told me to close it. Close it? No. I'm, I'm, I'm working with a and R's and I'm working with all these different people. What are you talking about? Close it. I had a brother in Christ to call, call me. He, he was my confirmation. Call me. He was obeying God. I was fighting with him. I was still, I was still in the headlock. Call me. This man was about to get signed with Universal Records. I'll never forget that. Universal Records wanted him passionately. I'm talking about Every other artist I was working with were trying to get signed. Universal Records and other companies were coming after him. And he was in the process of making a deal with Universal Records. He wasn't, a, he wasn't my artist, but he was in the process of making a deal with Universal Records. And I don't remember if he had a visitation or an encounter. He's, he is, I think he had a visitation from God. I don't know. It could have just been some type of encounter. He called me one day. He said, sis, delete my website. And listen, I had put my back into his website because I was I was decent. I was pretty good by the end. I was pretty decent. But I, I was like, this man's website got to be the bomb because his music. When I met him, that's how that's how I met him was that he hired me for his music because my my name was circulating in that industry. And so he got, you know, word of me and what happened, reached out to me. My work, my name was secretly. And he was like, sis, he hired me for his website. I listened to his music, heard his story. I said, uh-uh, I got to make sure that this man's website, this, this got to look like a million dollar website. It's got to look like a million dollar website. So it was my favorite. It was the one I was proud. I put it at the top of my portfolio. And he called me, he said, hey, sis, he said, delete my website. I thought he was mad at me. Did I do something wrong? Did you hire somebody else? He was like, no. So I don't know what happened to him, but I don't know, encounter, visitation. Well, a visitation is an encounter, but you can have another, other types of encounters with God. But I don't know what happened, but he told me he had had a brush with God and the Lord told him to give it all up. The Lord told him to give it all up. 
Another perfect example, my first lady. She was in school to be a doctor. She was right at the edge of graduating, right about to graduate. And the Lord told her to give it up. Now she has a school. She has her own school. People who make the sacrifice win. Those who keep arguing and trying to negotiate with God end up getting stuck with the mediocre that they thought was big. What is it that you're willing to give up? What is God telling you to let go of? Is it an ideology? A person? What is it that he's requiring you? The victim status? What is he requiring you to give up? Give it up so that you can have a testimony in your next season. Now, I'm not going to tell you that the road is easy because the hardship is what develops you. I'm not going to tell you that the road is going to be pretty. I'm not going to tell you that you're going to have those, that you won't have those moments that, hey, you, 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 because like I said, it took me two years to stop looking back at Florida. But I will tell you that when you reach even a, snippet of the breakthrough when you start to peer into the promised land before you even touch a grape before you touch anything you will know in that moment that it was well worth it i'm gonna tell you that this is from somebody who's lived it you will know in that hour you will know in that moment it was well worth it everything that i've had to sacrifice it was well worth my today because i have peace that surpasses all understanding i am happy I have joy. I am content. And I've lived under an open heaven. Ideas. Like I said, open heaven is just invisible money hitting your bank account. And you look, oh, y'all, yeah, we got. E open heaven. My pastor was talking about, I think that on, on tonight. But open heaven is really just ideas. That's all it is. It's a mindset. You got to give up the way that you think in order to embrace new ideologies. You got to give up the way that you think. You got to give up your victim mentality. You got to give up that gossiping. You got to give up the rejection. You got to sacrifice rejection. You got to climb out of the bed with rejection and stop letting it minister to you. You gotta get you gotta give up all of that stuff. You gotta give up that unforgiveness. You gotta give up your offense. You gotta give all of that stuff up in order for you to embrace this season. That's the word. That's it. That's all I got for you. I just wanted to come out of no bank. Like I said tonight, no notes. It's just me coming with you, coming to you, the Holy Spirit. What are you willing to let go of? What is God requiring of you? What are you afraid to let go of? Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac. God made him a father of many nations. When you're willing to make a sacrifice, God always grows whatever it is that he requires you to sacrifice. He always grows it. Why are you trying to hold on to that one? I had to make sacrifice of many things. Including family. I'm telling everybody to go out here and start busting on your family. I'm going to tell you, if they toxic and broken and the Lord tell you to walk away, he tell you, to, you may say, well, I don't think the Lord would tell me to walk away from family. I'll tell you this way. He says this, seek peace and pursue it. And where peace don't abide, dust your feet. Put boundaries in place. Set rules. Set guidelines. Put a price on your access. I'm going to leave it with that. Put a price on your access. Don't let everybody freely have access to you. The Lord told me, he said the definition, one of the def many definitions of a curse is being surrounded by people who don't honor you. Being surrounded by people who don't respect you. That's the way of having to close heaven. Because they can't hear from God regarding you. And it's through people around you that God blesses you. I need you to know that. All right, I'm going to let you guys go. Listen, I would love to mentor you. I would love, love, love to mentor you. Join Esther Prep University. Um, the ladies will post it here. 
Um, but join Esther Prep University. I would love to take the time to mentor you, to help you to get into your, Sister Aaliyah, thank you. God bless you, sis, to help you to enter into your next season. Understand this, entering into the season is information. I love to give you more information. I have a library with hundreds of rep, uh, messages in it. Um, I won't say hundreds, but tons of messages in it in um, Esther Prep University. So I would love you to join. Thank you, Biblical Babe. God bless you. I would love you to join. Sister Kelly posted up the information. Um, for Esther Prep, you can go to tiffanybuckner.com slash mentor for slash mentorship, or you can click, click the link. Uh, I would love to be your mentor. I would love to help you to break into your next season. Um, understand this, your season is not going to just come just because you're sitting there saying it's a new season. It's a new season. It ain't. Yeah. If you close your head, the heavens will close. He always gives away of his case, Sister Andrew. He always gives away of his case. Always in the way of escape typically doesn't make sense. It's, it's usually scary. It, it typically doesn't make sense. And this is why we don't think it's God. Take it from somebody that God has done a lot of deliverance with. You know, just taking me through all of those different seasons, bringing me out of all types of toxic, crazy situations that not only that I grew up in, but the, the ones I threw myself in because I didn't know any better. Because I didn't know any better. And um, he's taking me and I've had to make sacrifices and they weren't easy. I've had to, I'm talking about snotty tears on the floor, screaming out to God, being suicidal, wanting the Lord to kill me type sacrifices. Just laying down, <laughs> okay, just, just big old adult sized temper tantrums. But every time I've come to that place, I came to realize that I was at a crossroads. And at that crossroads, I was required to make a decision. And at that crossroads, you know, uh, my, my apostle deals with this in his book's altars. So be sure to get his book altars. But at that crossroads is an altar. I had to make a sacrifice. If you're not willing to make a sacrifice, you go back to the conference zone. You go back to the old season. You go back to the old season. At that, at that moment, you have to make a sacrifice. And it's not easy. And let's say, for example, you're in an abusive marriage and you don't have, no, you don't have anywhere to go. The sacrifice may be going into a shelter. It's not the, the sacrifice is ne is rarely ever favorable. It's rarely ever favorable conditions. Because that's what we, we we keep on looking. We were like, I will leave my comfort if you give me another another comfortable place to go. I I, I will I will leave this place. I, I will leave this 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 place. Because I have comfort here, even though it's come un uncomfortable, I found discomfort in the, in the comfort zone. I still find places of comfort called familiarity. If you give me a place to go that's comfortable, I'll leave. No, that's not sacrifice. Sacrifice is when you say, I'm going for broke. I'm going for broke. I'm scared. I don't know what's ahead. I don't know what tomorrow looks like. But what I do know is, God, that you're with me. What I do know is that you're with me, excuse me, and that you will never leave nor forsake me. I have history with you. Pull on that history. I have history with you. I've been in this place. I've been stressed out like this before. I've been scared like this before. I felt like this before and you have never let me down. Never. God bless you, sis. God's got you. God's got you. It'll be a testimony. It will be a testimony. Every sacrifice turns into a testimony. Every test turns into a testimony. Every test turns into a testimony. Every mess turns into a message. Just keep moving and keep growing, guys. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to close for real. There are some of you right now, you know what God is telling you to sacrifice. You better sacrifice it tonight while you have the energy to do it. When you have the message of God upon your heart. Remember I told you I was on the phone with that brother in Christ. 
And he was telling me, he said, the Lord wanted him to delete his site and give it all up. Thank you, uh, Marion. God bless you. Thank you, sis. Thank you. I said, that's confirmation. I said, but if I get off this phone with you, if I don't do something right now, if I get off this phone with you, I'm not going to do it. If I wait till tomorrow. So I said, stay on the phone. Stay on the phone. So I got up to my computer and I began to proceed to delete my site. I didn't know how to delete it. I don't know why I deleted it one page at a time. Now that I, I think maybe I just didn't know because now that I'm skilled, I've, I've built hundreds of websites. I know how to build them. I know, dang, you could have went there. But I, I deleted it pretty much one page at a time. One page at a time. Just deleting those, just deleting the pages. And I watched that thing go. Watch that thing go. Remember, I was uh, newly married at the time. Was I married? I don't know. If I was, we were newlyweds. If I wasn't, we were planning to get married. And um, he called me the next day. Or later, that, that was the next day. He said, baby, I went to your website and it's not, uh, where, where, where is your website? I said, I deleted it. He said, what? I said, I was talking about the such and such. And he, and we, he said, click. He hung up my face. I was like, I know he did just hang up in my face. No, he did just hang up in my face. I called him back because I said, I said it in my head. I said, maybe I mistakenly hung, mistake and hung up in, on him. So I called back. I was like, hey, the phone disconnected. Did I hang up or did he? He said, no, I hang up. You hung up. Why would you do that without consulting me? Who is he for you to talk to and hear that? If I wasn't married, that was my sign not to marry. Not to marry him anyhow. God will always give you a way of escape. I don't know who need to hear that. Relationship. God's been telling you that he ain't the one. I don't know who need to hear that. God's been telling you that's not right. It's not going to get better, sis. Whoever you are, I feel the Lord saying it's not going to get better. It's going to keep going downhill. Let him go. What you're experiencing is you holding on to something that God told you to let go of and now it's burning your hand. Let him go. Let him go. God says, I have better. He said, I have better for you. Anyhow, that's it. That's the message. I'm going to go. Love you guys. I pray that this message bless you. Do me a favor. Be sure to like and share. Join Esther Prep University. And I look forward to speaking to you guys again soon. All right. Thank you, Sister Nini. God bless you. Bye-bye.